morning, everybody. We're, uh, we're doing a little experiment today. There, you should have got a little explanation uh, with the bulletin about uh, we're doing our service in two parts today. The service is actually always in two parts. I mean, you don't know it because it flows together. But uh, in, ancient, in, ancient, in the ancient worship, there was the service of the word and the service of the sacrament. And they were kind of two separate things. In fact, in the ancient church, uh, the service of the word was open to anybody, and then people who weren't members of the church were dismissed <laughs> for the service of the sacrament. They weren't allowed to stay. And in fact, um, because they weren't allowed to stay for the celebration of the body and blood, there was even a, a rumor of cannibalism about the Christian church, because it was a private ceremony kind of thing. Uh, so we're not going to dismiss anybody. <laughs> um, Fear of that, that is why we're not dismissing it. Because otherwise, we might eat you. <laughs> so today we're doing that. The service of the word uh, will be kind of the contemporary portion. And then uh, several people have talked to me about uh, finding liturgy meaningful for them. And so the service of the sacrament uh, will be celebrated in a more uh, classical liturgical style. And uh, I, my... Um, I'll talk later more about where I think this could go in terms of the, what our church does and in terms of our outreach in the community. But for now, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for gathering us here together this morning. You have gathered us in love. You have good things in your heart for us. You desire the very best for us. And uh, your son, Jesus, died on the cross and rose from the grave uh, that we might be reconciled to you. And we are forever grateful. And so we begin our service with a moment of gratitude. <coughs> Thank you. In Jesus' name. Let's stand as we Things. His love endures forever. 
with the scripture reading for the day. Our reading comes from St. Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. And I will show you a still more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I have been known, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of thee is love. And we invite the children to come forward for the children. Because when you see things about love in the world, like if you're watching TV and one person says, I love you to another person, that usually means something like, I really like you a lot, 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 or you make me feel really good when I'm around you, or something like that, right? But Paul tells us that when God tells us to love other people, it's not like that. Because you can't force yourself to feel a certain way. You can't force yourself to like somebody else. You can't force yourself to feel like warm, mushy, tender feelings towards somebody else. And God doesn't tell us to do things that we can't actually, actually do, like force our feelings. And so when God says we're supposed to love each other, Paul really gives us a good direction. Because if you listen to this list, is this stuff that is like a feeling or is this some way you decide to act with other people? Patient. Is that, a, is that a feeling or is that a decision about how you act with other people? Well, it is both. You can actually feel patient also, but you can decide to be patient when you don't feel patient. And how about kind? Can you choose to be kind even when you don't feel kind? Yeah, you can. 
And, all, and on down the list, not envy, don't boast, don't be arrogant or rude, don't insist on your own way, don't be irritable or resentful, don't rejoice on the wrong things, but rejoice in the truth. All those things are things we can do, even if we don't feel loving at the moment. And so that's really what God's trying to draw us into, is a life that, that is, certainly has feelings, but where the way we treat other people is, is not governed by how we feel about them. And the way God does that is by being that way with us. You could, you could change this scripture around and say, God is patient with me. God is kind to me. God is not boastful like, you know, lording it over me. He's not mean to me. He's not irritable or resentful. And that's pretty good news, I think, for us. Because God doesn't, like, threaten us to help us be kind and patient and stuff. He's kind and patient with us to draw us up into that life. Because that's the life Jesus died for us to have. And that's why confession is part of the Christian faith. Because we know we're never going to meet that, right? How many of you have been unkind in the past week or two? Yeah, me too. How many of you have been a little irritable in the past week or two? Uh, it means you're kind of easily annoyed. <laughs> And so that's why confession is part of our faith, too, because, because this, the, the life God is calling us into is, like a, is something we walk toward. It's not something we attain. We, we never quite get there, but we want to move toward there in this life. And so that's, that's the children's message for today, is that we are supposed to be patient, kind, etc. God is patient and kind with us, and his patience and kindness is meant to draw us into a life that matches the definition of love that we read in the And you guys can go. A couple of announcements while the children go out. Uh, Bible studies this week are uh, it's Monday night on, Monday night at the Lovelace is 7 o'clock. Wednesday morning at 10 at Wycliffe Headquarters Building down Moss Park Road. And Wednesday evening from 7 to 8 sharp at uh, Panera Bread. So if you want to come to a Bible study where we're going to dig further into this passage... Uh, come to that. Youth night is this Friday night back at Sarah's house. Right, Sarah? Wait, what? Youth night. <laughs> Wait, that's what? Right. That's right. No, the second, it's the second. We, had, we, we actually have an extra. Oh, so it's not this Friday. Right. We skipped. Okay. All right. So. It's the second, second and fourth Fridays. Okay. Uh, Ash Wednesday observance on February 10th. I'm still kind of looking for a place to have that. We'll figure something out. And we will have an Ash Wednesday observance for people who want to uh, be part of that. And then the Seder meal on uh, March 24th, I have a, someone coming to lead our Seder meal this year instead of me. It's a guy from a ministry called Chosen People Ministries, which is a Jewish outreach. So he should be able to bring a lot more uh, uh, of the culture and, and the richness that goes into the Seder meal that I don't, I'm not, I don't always provide. And he'll probably pronounce all the words right, too. So... Uh, <laughs> Those are any other announcements this week. It's the fifth Sunday of the month, so there's probably nothing else. All right. So, uh, Doug, if you want to sure. do your thing. My thing. Yeah. Here. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Please make sure that you fill out the card uh, this morning. Let us know that you're here. And then on the other side, uh, when you uh, write down your prayer request or praise report, please remember to check the two small boxes at the very bottom. We will be collecting an offering this morning for those of you who may be here as visitors. There's no obligation. But for those of us who worship regularly, this is our opportunity to worship God through the offerings that we have to support the ministry here in Lake Nona. Let me pray for us this morning. Heavenly Father, it's good to, to worship here. It's good to be here. And we give you thanks to that you provided a way for us to be here that you've led us here, and now we ask that you lead us in knowing what you would want for us in the message that Pastor John's going to provide for us. Thanks, Doc. So we're looking at this uh, reading from 1 Corinthians, and it's 1 Corinthians 13. It's kind of a great love chapter, and I just want to give you a little bit of a uh, background that on Corinthians, just to give you context, uh, Corinth was, uh, I think I've said this before, I've never actually been to Miami, but from what I know about Miami on TV, it's a rough place, port city, 
Uh, you can say anything you want in Miami. And Corinth was like that. It was a port city. And so there's a lot of stuff going on that, that uh, you know, every level of human activity you can imagine is in Corinth. So this is Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. And he wrote at least one or two others because uh, he references other communication in the letter. But this is, we only have first and second Corinthians. And as he goes through this, he writes to them about several things. And this is uh, chapter 13. So there's a lot that's gone on ahead of time. And that's important to understand why he gets to this point. And, and when he gets here, this is kind of the pinnacle. This is, this is where he, um, he kind of works up to this. And then he kind of goes back down the other side. And so he addresses all sorts of practical kind of problems uh, about marriage and lawsuits and divisions among uh, different people saying, I follow Paul, but I follow Paulus. And he's like, what in the world? You all follow Jesus, don't you? And he talks about eating food sacrifice to idols. And he kind of comes through here and he warns people against idolatry. And then he talks about how they celebrate the Lord's Supper, which is they have these divisions among themselves. Some people get drunk on the wine and, and other people don't. They like eat it all before other people get to the altar to have their communion. And, and they're also separated by like the, the wealthy and the commoners. And he's kind of telling them all this stuff about how uh, he's trying to tell them how the, the life that Christ has really called us to live. Because if you live with all this other stuff, then, then you're kind of, you're missing out, he says, on the life that Christ has for you, which is a life of peace, a life without anxiety, he says. Uh, and so he goes through all these practical things, and then he talks about spiritual gifts and how we are one body with many members. And then this is where he finally gets to this passage where he says, Now, let me show you an even more excellent way. And he takes us down to the foundations of our behavior. The foundation of the way Christians behave. And, and that's going to help us. The foundations are important because those other uh, the other things about, uh, you know, eating food to sacrifice to idols and, um, and uh, the way you practice communion, those are, those are like top-level things. Those are practices, and those are good instructions, but they're not going to help you in new situations. They're not going to help you in new situations, and that's why you have to dig down to get to the principles, because our situation is different than the lives of the people in Corinth 3,000 years ago. It doesn't almost have to be said. And so what we need to do is, with Paul, get down to those principles that are going to help us navigate new situations as uh, believers in Jesus Christ. And so that's where we get to 1 Corinthians 13, kind of a pinnacle passage of this thing. And it's divided into three sections. The first section uh, that Matthew read uh, is very familiar. It's, the whole thing, I think, is probably pretty familiar to most of us. But this is where he read, I'm going to show you the excellent way. If I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Listen to the, the, kinds of, the kind of things that you might aspire to. The kind of things you think are awesome. The kind of things you look at somebody else and say, Wow, that's the kind of person I want to be. I want to have that. If I can speak in tongues or speak like an angel, but don't have love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. So if I'm the best public speaker in the world, but I don't have love, it's like someone banging a gong. If I have prophetic powers and I can fathom mysteries and knowledge, you know those people who, like, they got, they got the Bible down. I mean, they just, like suck things out of the Bible, you didn't even know we're in there. And you're like, wow, dude, I wish I could be half of what you are. He says, if you can do that, and you don't have love, and if I have faith to remove mountains, then I am nothing. In fact, he says, if I give away everything, you, if there's people out there who are just like those exceedingly, have the gift of generosity, and they just give stuff away, and they're so generous. And you look at them and say, wow, I just wish I could open my, my heart and my life and, and my checking account and my house and, and just be quite as generous as that person. I admire them. Paul says, if I give away everything I have, but I have not love, I gain nothing. And then he says, if I give up my body to be burned. Now, that's a little weird for us. 
But what that implies is martyrdom, because this is 55 AD, and by this time, the Christian church is under persecution in parts of the world, and Christians are, in fact, being martyred for their faith. And so, and, and of course, you can fully understand, I think, that martyrs would uh, hold a place of high honor among the community, because ra they are willing to die rather than compromise or uh, diminish their faith in Jesus Christ. And they honor, I, I, geez, I, I think that's, high, that's amazing. I, I, you know, I, I always wonder what I would do if that came down to me. And he says, even if it's that, even if you have that, and you have not love, you gain nothing. So he says, this is the core, love. And without love, you're not living God's life. You're not doing God's work. You can do whatever else you want, and if, it, if it's not, if it's not, if love isn't moving through it, it's not what God wants for you. And then this, the third part, we're going to we're going to go one, three, two. The third part is where it says love never ends, and he says, as for prophecies, they'll pass away, tongues will cease, knowledge will pass away. Now we know in part, prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial passes away. When I was a child, I thought like a child. I, Reason like a child, when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. Now we see in a mirror dimly, then we see face to face. Now I know in part, then I will know fully, even as I've been fully known. So you get the now and then, now and in the time to come kind of thing he's drawing. And what he's trying to do is help us see that there are three core things for our life right now. He says faith and hope and love. And then he says the greatest of these is love. And that's where that now and then thing comes in. Because uh, uh, he says faith and hope and love. What is faith? Faith is the assurance of things not seen. One day we will see even as we are seen. And so one day there will be no need for faith. Because we will be walking by sight in the presence of Christ. Hope. Hope is the assurance of things that you don't have yet. Hope is what you know is coming in Jesus, and one day we will have it, and so we will have no more need for hope. So he says, really, the only thing left at the bottom of the pot when you boil everything else away is love. And if you can start with love, if you can let love undergird everything you do, if love can be the, the, the main ingredient, then you'll do all right. You'll do all right. If you start with love and let that percolate into whatever situation you face, you'll be okay. You'll be following God's way of life. And then he does what I really like. I'm so appreciative of him. He clarifies what love is. And he gives us very practical, uh, behavioral kind of things. He says love, and I, this is what I said to the kids too, because I, I, I find this worth reflecting on on a regular basis. Love is not feeling warm toward everybody. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but it rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. So love is a decision about how to treat people. When God says, love your neighbors as yourself, the greatest commandment, well, the greatest commandment is love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But the greatest commandment in terms of our life on the earth is love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. And you're not going to feel warmly toward all your neighbors. Anybody have a neighbor? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> Does anyone have a neighbor you don't feel warmly toward? <laughs> yeah, probably so. <clears throat> but God doesn't tell us to feel warmly toward people. God doesn't tell us to find attraction in people. He says we're supposed to be patient with people. We're supposed to be kind with people. We're not supposed to envy people or boast around them or be arrogant around them or rude around them, or insist on our own way, or be irritable or resentful. We're not supposed to rejoice when wrong things happen, but rejoice when the truth happens. Bear with people, believe people, hope for people, endure people. It's very, very practical. 
Let's put it on the list. So we got the things to do and the things not to do. And this is, this is great because sometimes, uh, sometimes ideas of faith can be very sort of, you know, there's a lot that goes on with faith that's very sort of mysterious. The Lord's Supper, which we're going to celebrate in a little while. Um, prayer. There's lots of mysterious things. And here Paul gives us some practical advice. <clears throat> now I'm looking at this list. And I'm thinking, some of those come pretty easy. And some of them not so much. And I'm thinking if you, if you pause for a moment and, and take a moment of being really, you know, sort of honest and self-reflective with yourself, you'll probably look at that list and say, some of those come pretty naturally to me. Whew. Some of them not so much. And so that, that's, uh, that's where I want to uh, take our time together thinking about this passage now. I, I want to talk about how these things are going to grow. How are these going to grow in our life? Especially those ones where not so much. Some people would say this. Some people would say you cannot give what you haven't been given. You can't give what you don't have. And some people would say that it's possible that when you look at this list, the things that you have trouble with are the things that you either haven't or have trouble receiving. And, and, and the psychologist will tell you this has a lot to do with the authority figures in your life when you were growing up. But uh, whether that's true or not, the things that are on this list that trouble us probably in some instances, are the way we treat ourselves even more than we have that trouble with other people. Let's say uh, we're supposed to be kind and we have trouble being kind. I'd say there's a decent possibility you're not very kind to yourself if you have trouble being kind to other people. If you have trouble being patient with other people, I would say there's a good chance you're not really very patient with yourself either. And on down the list. If you have trouble being hopeful with other people, maybe you're not very hopeful with yourself. If you have trouble enduring, sticking with other people, maybe you don't really see much, you kind of don't stick with yourself. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but it's like, you know, that's part of hopeful and, and, and loving yourself and being kind and everything. So I think when I look at this list, that the, the things I have trouble with are the, with other people are the things that I don't feel like I have in me about myself either. That's why you love your neighbor as yourself. I think there's wisdom in that. Should be, Jesus said it. Um, not instead of yourself. So I want to do a little bit of, uh, I want to do actually a little bit of math with you. It's, it's, uh, it's a... Um, it's a little, it's, yeah, it's a little math. Uh, and I'm going to, uh, Frank, I'm going to abuse, I'm going to abuse math a little bit here. It's not going to be quite right. Just ignore it. But I didn't, I didn't. <laughs> here it comes. Here it comes. So, I'm going to pull another verse out here. We know love is patient, right? Love is patient. God is love. We know that too. That's a Bible verse. First John 4, verse 8. God is love. It's all throughout the Bible. You can't miss the fact that God is love. So here's the math. It's called the transitive property equality. And it goes like this. If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. So here's how I'm applying this to what we're learning today. If God is love and love is patient, then God is patient. Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. If love is kind, if God is love and love is kind, then God is kind. Does that make sense, right? And so it goes all the way down that list that we have. Where this list not only gives us direction for our lives, but it helps us, it lets Scripture continue its work of rewriting the scripts we play in our head about what God is like. 
that's where I want to go. That's where I want to pause with and think about more uh, today with this. Because these are about God. We just proved it mathematically. You can't argue with me. <laughs> God is patient. God is kind. God rejoices in the truth. God bears with people, believes in people, hopes with people, endures with people. God is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude or selfish or irritable or resentful. And he doesn't rejoice in when things go wrong. That is God. That is God uh, and the way he feels about people. Now, I'm going to go back to a feeling because there's a feeling that goes under these that will help us move into these in our lives with other people. And it's not like, it's not be attracted to, it's not find a positive influence in our life. It's compassion. Compassion is going to help us grow these in our lives. Romans 2 verse 4 says God's kindness is meant to lead us to repentance. So, God, what we would say, this is the way God is, and what I want you to hear today, is this is the way God is with me. This is the way God is with you. And there's a good chance that some of those overt words don't quite match the way you instinctively think about how God thinks about you. Do you believe that God is very hopeful about you? Do you believe that God is patient with you? Do you believe that God is kind toward you? He feel, he's got that kindness. Do you believe that he endures with you? Do you believe God believes in you? That's a big deal. God's kindness is meant to lead us to repentance. And remember, repentance does not mean feel bad. Repentance means a, a turn around in the way you're thinking. God's kindness is meant to remake our thinking. God's kindness is meant to remake our attitudes. And this is where scripture, where Christianity, where our faith shines, is because in all other faiths, this would be the list of things you have to do to be acceptable to God and get in his kingdom. And in, in the Christian faith, in God as he really is, as revealed in Jesus Christ, this is the list of how God is toward us. This is the list of things God does toward us to try to woo us back, to draw us back to him in love. And this is why confession becomes such an important part of our lives. Because without confession, you're not pausing to remember that God is kind to you. Because in confession, you acknowledge that you need kindness from God. Without confession, you're not acknowledging God is patient with you because you're not acknowledging that you need patience. And on down the line. And that's, confession is what opens the doors for God's grace. Confession is what lets God pour these things into you so that they start to grow in you like a plant and grow like a fruit. The Bible calls them fruit of the Spirit. So God pours these things into us and they grow inside of us. And then... We have compassion on other people as God has had compassion on us. And lo and behold, because, because we feel compassion on another person, we are compelled. That's what the Bible says, the love of Christ compels us. We are compelled, and not in a horrible way, but in, in, a, in a strong, godly, do the right thing because God loves us kind of way. We are compelled to be kind. We are compelled to be patient and on down the list. <coughs> And so this is, this is what I want you to see today, is that this is the way God is with you. And I want you to see that it is God's kindness, not his judgment. It's his mercy, not his punishment, that is going to draw you into higher and higher levels of love, which is the calling of our faith. And so what I want you to do, this, I'm going to give you a little exercise here. On the attendance card, there's a little tear-off card, right? And, and uh, hopefully you use that all the time to take notes or make a little thing. What I would like you to do is think about one of these things 
that you realize maybe you're not that kind of way with yourself sometimes, and maybe it's because in your head you don't really think God thinks that way about you. And what I want you to do is, regardless of what you think right now, I want you to write God blank with me on that card. God blank with me. So you might be the kind of person who is not very kind to yourself. And I want you to write, God is kind with me on that card. Maybe you're, not, maybe you're the person who's not very patient with yourself. I want you to write, God is patient with me on the card. And on down the list, just pick one. One of those is going to like pop out at you. And, uh, and write that God is that way with you because that's the way that thing is going to grow up in your life. And now let us pray. Father in heaven, you have uh, uh, given us an amazing word. It's nice on a high top level to have uh, practical guidance on what it really means to love so that we can just uh, choose loving attitude because we are choosing to be followers of your son, Jesus Christ. But we also know that we fall short all the time. And we know that this is the way you have treated us and you are pouring this stuff into us through your compassion so that as we grow in compassion, this stuff grows and flowers and blooms in our life. I ask you to help each of us this week find one of those little things, one of these things on the list that, that hits us in a place that we need to be hit, that, that we think of you in new ways as patient or kind or not arrogant, or not rude, not jumping down our throats, as someone who endures with us, who's hopeful about us. And, and let us grow in that so that we can grow in love, so that we can be Jesus' ambassadors of love in the world. In Jesus' name, amen. So, this is the funky part right here. We're going to uh, take a five-minute break as we move into the liturgical time. And what this break is for, it's a time to bring your offerings and your prayer cards up here and put them in the altar because we're not going to collect them. Um, it's a time just to be quiet and meditate. Uh, it's also a time to get whatever needs you need. You know, maybe you have to go to the bathroom in the middle of service, I don't know. But it's a chance to sort of move from the, the, move from the engagement. The, the sermon is kind of a time where you're thinking and grappling and engaging. And, and liturgy is more ancient words that wash over us. Some of them 3,000 years old. And they, they come over us and they push on us and they just, they are, they, uh, they're, they, liturgy is a little bit more like getting on a raft and being carried down the Grace River. And so as we move into the liturgy part, we want to just sort of get into a quieter, more contemplative way of being this morning. So we'll be reconvening in five minutes. <laughs>
Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you with all our word and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all of your sin. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his command and authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended to God. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From where he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, one holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. To the Christ, to the Christ. It is truly good, right, and beneficial that we should at all times and at all places give thanks to you, Holy Father, Almighty God, and Prince of Peace, for you have shown us patience and kindness and love and compassion in Jesus Christ. And therefore, we at all times and at all places will extol you and praise you and talk of you and sing of you, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God, God our might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his blood and his body on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and your spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers. Deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Father, you have called us here together to be your people, your sons and daughters, who come to you knowing that you love us, having been shown that in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so now we come to you with the prayers of our life, and we come to you as you bid us come, your dear children in Jesus. We want to pray, Lord, for uh, Carrie's father, Jack. You know his situation and his need. And we lift him up to you, along with her and the whole family, for your guidance and your peace. We also want to pray for those who serve in our armed forces in America and across the world, that you would protect them, not just in their body, but in their uh, mind and spirit that they may be people who continue in your love even as they engage in the use of force as part of their vocation. We want to pray for uh, healing for Randy and Jody who have uh, caught something and it's kind of hanging on. We want to uh, continue our prayers for the scheduling of the uh, esophageal procedure for Phil and that that would successfully remove all of the cancer cells and that he would uh, be given a clean bill of health after that procedure. We want to pray for Eddie and Kyle, that uh, they would be reconciled to their parents. Father, you are the God of reconciliation, and so we pray that your love and reconciliation in Jesus Christ would uh, filter down into those relationships. We want to pray for people everywhere under persecution, that they would be released. We pray for the hearts of the persecutors, that they would be turned to you, and we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ, that you would give them a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit, uh, that they would have um, 
compassion on their tormentors who are truly the ones in prison that they might have a testimony of your love and even bring that to those who persecute them. We want to pray for mission and ministry workers that are close to our hearts, for Tom and Marilyn, for Wayne and Grace, for Mike and Leanne, and for David and Ruth. We continue our prayers for Barbara and Ralph uh, as they walk the road of dementia. We pray for them and their whole family to have peace and their family to have understanding. We continue our prayers for local ministries we support, for Here's Life Inner City, for the Prince of Peace Food Pantry, for Kairos Prison Ministries, and for the Central Florida Children's Home. We continue our prayers for uh, Margie, who has terminal cancer. Uh, we want to praise you that her condition has stabilized, and we pray that that time will be a time of joy uh, for her and her loved ones, and that, 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 um, that they would be able to receive that uh, gift of stabilization with joy. We continue our prayers uh, for Rick Campbell, who's been fighting his lymphoma for more than a year. We pray that you would give him and his family peace and also that you would bring him to healing. We want to pray uh, for Chuck uh, Knudsen, who's having chronic pain. We pray for a, a lifting up of that pain. We also want to pray for uh, Kathy Clark uh, as she uh, undergoes procedures that they would do what they need to do for her. We pray for people around the world uh, who don't know that you have done it all in Jesus Christ and that you are not the God of the checklist, but you are the God of patience and kindness and redemption and new life and forgiveness and peace. And that you are the God who made us and loves us and children is calling us home. That is good news. And we pray for everyone everywhere in your kingdom to be part of bringing that into the lives of other people. We want to pray especially for Wycliffe and crew and Lutheran Bible translators as they uh, endeavor to bring that word into the world. We want to pray for our own congregation, Lord, that... Uh, that you would continue to help us bloom as a place of love. Uh, we also want to pray very specifically about a new uh, possibility of a place uh, that might be the right place at the right time for the right amount, uh, that would be a real house of prayer and love and community in Lake Nona. And uh, we pray that you would show us the path to make that happen. And uh, we lift that up also to you. All these things we lift up to you in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who's taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he passed it to his disciples, and said, Drink of this, all of you. This cup is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. We speak the Lamb of God together. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace. Please be seated. Welcome to the Lord's Day. It's not provoked and it seeks not its own. 
We speak together the words of the note of this. Lord, now you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of the glory of people. A light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people in Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through this same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Oh, mm-hmm. 
Lord, make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. Lord, look upon you with favor 